guys uh welcome to talking about oral presentations um let's get started okay so here here i'm going to just talk about a few tips about like the structure and um thinking about um the actual performance itself um okay so off we go so with your intros what I would really recommend that you think about starting with is an attention grabber. Now an attention grabber can be really anything um, that's going to surprisingly grab attention. Um, it could start with a quote from someone smart, um, so like Albert Einstein or Mandela or Arthur Miller, um, basically anyone who we would consider an authority on the issue that you're talking about. Um, you could also start with a joke, obviously depending on your topic. Um, if you're going to be talking a lot about genocide, I feel like a joke is probably not the best choice for you, um, but you know, read the audience. Um, an anecdote is a good way to start, so telling us a story about something that you have experienced. Um, a case study, so that might be, um, you know, um, something that happened to to somebody else um, or um, you know perhaps a actual legal case that would be really interesting to kind of start us telling telling this story about um, a case that had actually happened um, a metaphor is a nice way to start um, particularly I think a metaphor is nice if you present the metaphor early and then kind of carry it through um, so like having something um, like representing the idea that you're talking about um, I think that's really cool a shocking statement is a good way to start um, you know because it gets our attention we're like what um, that can be really kind of interesting obviously you don't want it to be anything that people are going to find offensive though use your common sense um, or you could just start with some statistics um, sometimes statistics are a good way to start particularly if they're very um, shocking or um, you know, I guess eye-opening. Once you've done your attention grabber, then state your contention clearly. Okay, make it very clear that I know the answer um, to to your your issue. Okay, um, so make sure that I am well aware of what your your contention is, and then I would just outline my arguments. Alright, now I would just want to show you a little example of um, a really good persuasive um, oral presentation um, introduction that I think um, will give you, you know, a, I guess a bit of inspiration. So, sorry, navigating the school system. Okay, now I'll just pause here enlarge it now you can actually access this this is still available on YouTube obviously um, and she actually is really really great um, at um, explaining persuasive speech um, structure she does great little videos on things like eye contact um, tone all of that kind of stuff so if you're looking for extra tips um, look up this lady um, if you just search um, persuasive speaking tips it will pop up so that would be my recommendation if you're looking for more stuff. Um, she's awesome. She was kind of part of the expert village thing that was done a while ago, but now um, she's still available online. Anyway, so without further ado, here's the lady in the red sweater. Well, intense. Imagine overcrowded conditions, so intense that death is all around you feces and urine and the conditions are so tight that you can't learn to walk properly that's just the beginning next you get crammed onto a truck drive for hundreds of thousands of miles with no food no water again crammed feces urine death all around you now, I'm just going to pause there and talk about what she's doing. So she is giving us an anecdote. Well, I guess it's more of a case study than an anecdote. But um, she's giving us this um, case study. And what she's doing in it is creating this really vivid um, imagery 
where we have no choice but to kind of imagine this this life and she's actually instructing us to imagine it and that is creating this like intense sense of empathy towards whatever it is that is experiencing this the other thing is that she hasn't actually identified what we are um kind of imagining ourselves as um which allows us to kind of I guess indulge that idea that oh god maybe this is human beings which we kind of consider as you know completely a horrible thing to to experience as a human being um but even when we're thinking that oh perhaps it's an animal we're still horrified by this so um yeah really really clever all right let's continue again just the beginning of the massive suffering that is going to take place. You arrive at the plant and they load you off of the truck onto a conveyor belt, which immediately grabs your legs and shackles you upside down before it swings you through an electrified bath, followed by a neck slicer before you get dumped into a scalding bath of hot water. Again, very graphic, very heavy on the imagery. Even um, <clears throat> using um, like, you know, hand gestures and stuff for us to really kind of feel it. And even her facial expressions are very kind of emblematic of how we should feel about this. This is horrible. Massive suffering is what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the trip from beginning to end for billions of chickens every year. And the unfortunate thing is that they are so stressed out and so crazed by the events transpiring that many of them, nine billion or more in fact a year, never quite get electrified and never quite get their necks cut before they're dumped into that scalding hot boiling bath all right so what... oh, sorry <laughs> um so she actually presents to us that we're talking about chickens now she obviously holds back on telling us that they're chickens because chickens are some a, an animal that we find really hard to identify with um so she holds that information back until we're ready to process it um and in fact often i show these this video to kids and they're like uh who cares about chickens but then you know and they laugh but then they actually realize oh no it's still kind of horrible even for chickens to go through this um so that's that's the power of what she she's doing there with the imagery the chicken has to look forward to because the humane society action group that regulates cruelty to animals in the slaughterhouse does not participate with poultry. It is essential at this time that we take a look at the suffering of these animals and take an action to get humane conditions put in place in the poultry factory. Okay. So, no, we don't need to hear more. Um, so, you know, it's effective because she also has great word choice where she's talking about it's essential. Um, when she's giving her, um, her contention, she says it is essential, which, you know, has that sense of urgency to it. Um, so things like that are really important um, to, to kind of keep in mind. So things like what kind of attention grabber you're going to use, how you're going to present your contention in a clear and concise way, um, and really make it powerful with word choice. All right, let's move on. <clears throat> paragraphs. Now, it's paragraphs are pretty straightforward. You need, just like you do with any piece of writing, one argument per paragraph. Okay, so give me one reason why you're right per paragraph. Make sure you base your structuring around Teal, but I feel like with persuasive speeches, you've got like a little bit more like leeway, um, you know, that you don't have to be 
um, so dogmatic about our teal. Um, but you still need to give me a topic sentence, you still need to provide evidence, you still need to explain the significance of that evidence, and you still need to link it to your argument. So ultimately, you know, teal is just a good way to structure any sort of writing. Um, one thing I would stress is that you ha you need to have evidence to back, back up your arguments. You can't just go, I'm right because one, two, three. You need to say, I'm right because of one, and here's some evidence to prove it. Okay. Now, that evidence could be anecdotal, that could be facts, that could be expert opinions. It can be a range of different ways that you, you give evidence, so to speak. <coughs> Within your paragraphs, try and use as many and as varied persuasive techniques as you can. Remember, that's the key component of the marking. This is a persuasive speech. Ultimately, if you don't persuade, you haven't done the job. So make sure you're using those persuasive techniques. All right, signposting. Now, signposting is something that we tell people not to do in a, in a written essay, but in a speech, it is super valuable. Okay, try to use signposting as a form of your topic sentence. Now a signpost is where you tell me what to expect in your speech and you identify when you're moving to another point. Okay, you need to explicit, be explicit when you're moving on to a new point, when you're doing um, speeches. Because we can't read your piece, we can't go back and reread things and make sure we understand it. So telling me that you're moving on to a new point is actually quite useful. Now. What can a signpost sound like? You can say things explicitly like, another argument is, my first point is, my second point is. You can definitely do that in a speech. I would encourage it, okay? You could use a rhetorical question and then you proceed to answer it. So for instance, you could go, so why do we need this? So why do I think this? The answer is simple, it is because. Okay, that's another good way of signposting. Um, be creative with your signposting, but definitely try and use them if possible. Okay, where you kind of start off going, firstly, I want to talk to you about this. Secondly, I want to talk about this. Thirdly, that's this is what I'm making. Okay. The other thing that I would try and do is to pause between your points, so between your arguments. Okay, Pauses are really essential in speeches because they signal the end of a point for me and it, it kind of goes, okay, so I've talked about this one thing, now I'm going to talk about the next thing. It makes me anticipate what's coming next. Pause for slightly longer than you think feels natural. So um, I always say a three count is really good. So, you know, you make one point and then you go, one, two, three, next point, okay? Um, that gives me enough time to kind of digest what you're saying. All right, rebuttal. Um, if your topic is particularly controversial, or your point is controversial, um, as it should be, because it's persuasive, um, you will need to explain why your opposition is wrong. Now, you're best to leave that towards the end of the speech, but before the conclusion, okay? A basic rebuttal is something like, some people say X, but this is wrong because Y. A far better approach is outlining the opposing agreement uh, outlining the opposing argument and then explaining why it's invalid okay and then telling me why your approach is better okay so um, that's probably a better way to do it but try and work in some rebuttal but make sure you actually rebut it don't just present the opposing argument and move on you need to tell me why they're wrong okay now, rebuttal arguments. There is loads of different ways that we can be wrong, okay? Um, I've got a whole bunch of them listed there. So a flaw in the logic of the argument. Um, the argument might, might lack relevance um, under particular circumstances. Uh, the argument might be factually inaccurate. Um, the argument might have unintended consequences. So, you know, maybe if, you know, for instance, I don't know, you were talking about asylum seekers and you were like, oh, well, um, you know, if we start letting everybody in, then that's going to be a, a problem. Maybe that's the argument. And you might say, well, the unintended consequence of that is that if we stop letting anybody in, 
then innocent people are going to die. And that's not intent, that's not your intention, but that's what will happen. Um, or you might be able to argue that the argument, while it is valid, it's of marginal significance, like it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. Um, so for instance, again, with the asylum seeker one, you might kind of go, well, yeah, okay, um, we might we might let in people who um, are not the kind of people we want in our country, but in the grand scheme of things, if we don't let um, asylum seekers in, then honestly what we're doing is putting a whole bunch of innocent people at risk for the risk of a very, very small minority. Okay, so you've really got to think about your rebuttal and how you can prove it's wrong. Persuasive techniques. Okay, you must use a range of them and you need to use them effectively. Don't just give me a whole lot of rhetorical question. That is boring, okay? Um, use a range of them. Um, and they also need to be easily identifiable, okay? So you need to be very clear in your persuasive technique use, okay? Conclusions. All right, so a basic approach, restate your contention forcefully. Make sure I'm very clear when you walk away from that speech what your contention was. Find a nice, eloquent quote that supports your contention. So somebody who is smarter than you that agreed with you. Um, use a rhetorical question, perhaps, to prompt the audience to consider what they should do now. Um, make a strong, inclusive statement, perhaps, would be a nice way to finish. Or you might do a bit of a call to action and state what needs to happen next. Like, what do you want them to do? Do they Are they to write to their local member? Are they to get out and protest on the streets? Are they to demand more from their governments? What are they supposed to do? Um, to add a bit of wow, you want to go a little bit further, think about how you begun your speech. Can you create, you know, some sort of cycle so that it's like um, maybe you started off with an anecdote and maybe you could tell that anecdote again and provide a different ending. So like with the chicken lady, instead of having um, the chickens go through the neck slicer and whatever, um, perhaps she tells another anecdote of animals um, being treated more humanely um, and kind of goes, this is the dream. Uh, if you had a shocking fact at the start, maybe you might return to it and reference it again. Um, you know, it's nice to kind of create that site, you know, that cyclical feeling for us. Um, you know, people really like that feeling of, oh yes, I see how this is all related. Can I read my speech? <sighs> no, you can't. Well, mainly because this is not a reading test. It's a speech. I assume you're in VCE, you can read. Maybe that's an assumption going too far, but that's the assumption I have nonetheless. So, why can't you read it? Well, because it completely disengages your audience. I am not interested in hearing you read, okay? It kills your delivery um, because, you know, you're not even looking at me. It also destroys your structure um, because you're just reading um, without any kind of pauses or interest. And because if you don't care enough about what you're saying to memorize it and look up at us, I mean, why should I be interested? And for all those reasons, and because I will take points off you if you read it. That's pretty straightforward. So, what can you do? You can memorize as much speech as, sorry, you can memorize as much of your speech as possible. You can have cue cards, but I would stick to dot points. Ultimately, whatever you put on those cards is your decision, but I would try and stick to just dot points because then they're prompts for you to think about what you want to talk about and it's not a script. And that way you're not going to be as tempted to read. Um, I would also try and have palm cards that are discreet, that actually fit in my palm. Do not turn up with a piece of A4 paper because that is not a cue card. Um, make eye contact with your audience. For most, like 
if you want a percentage of your speech. Or if you can't face looking at people, look at their foreheads or look at objects in the room that are at head height that I can kind of, you know, assume that you are making eye contact. Now, eye contact is not the holy grail, okay? It's not going to give you an A plus automatically, but it's the first step to unlocking any sort of meaningful engagement with your audience, okay? That's how you engage with me. Okay, looking at your audience allows you to react to them and to control things like pace and tone and volume and stance and hand gestures more effectively. You can actually read people and say and think to yourself, are they getting this? Do I need to slow down? Do I need to speed up? Am I boring them? What do I need to do? So, oh, sorry, that's a double up. Um, what else can you do to improve your speeches? Well, you can build in some gestures. So like numbering points off on your fingers um, or open your palms when you're asking a question and so on. Um, make sure you, you vary the tone and volume of your speech as well. Don't speak in a monotone. That's super boring. Um, by kind of going up and down in volume and tone, it'll allow you to kind of build in like light and shade that emphasize um, or create emotion to certain sections. Um, so have a think about like where you want to kind of get louder, get softer, get, um, you know, a, an angry tone where you want to sound sympathetic and actually mark that on your cards. Um, use pauses to add emphasis to key moments and make sure you're aware of your stance. Be aware of how you're going to stand up there. Um, no leaning, no arms crossing. Be open and confident. Try and avoid unnecessary movements of your feet. People shift their legs around a lot. Try and stand straight, stand tall and speak to me. Another way that you can kind of, you know, improve your speeches is to watch another VCE kid do your performance. Get another one of your mates or whatever to watch your performance and point out your performance flaws. So, you know, do you play with your hair while you're speaking and you've just never noticed? Do you speak too fast, too slow, too monotone, whatever? Um, and that way you can kind of help each other. So how do I improve my delivery? First, rehearse a lot. Practice first in front of the mirror, then you really need to practice in front of an audience, whether that is your parents, whether that's your friends, whether that is grandparents, neighbours, random street people, whatever. Another way you can do it is you can record yourself doing it and then review it um, and, and improve from that respect. Kind of watch yourself doing it and go, uh -huh, I never noticed that I actually move around a lot. I need to stop doing that. I need to be aware of that. So that's a good way to do it too. All right, so hopefully that helps you a little bit with getting organized for your oral presentations. Um, good luck. See you later.